This is Incredible Stories Podcast, Episode 22, Fatty Arbuckle, Blacklisted for Murder. Hello, everyone. It's time for another Incredible Stories podcast. I'm Josh Virla, your accusable host, and thanks for being here. The 1920s were known as the Roaring Twenties, a period of time when economic prosperity boomed and the culture got more edgy. Sex, art, and booze was on the forefront of American society, and perhaps no place better represented the fun times as Hollywood. The mecca for the young American film industry was also a mecca for debauchery. And this image was not lost on Hollywood itself, and the American public in general. Fatty Arbuckle, one of the biggest stars in Hollywood at the time, found himself smack dab in the eye of the storm in 1921 when he was accused of rape and manslaughter and the three subsequent trials that followed had a lasting effect not just on his career, but the film industry for many years to come. Here's what I know. Fatty Arbuckle, who had a hilarious name, was actually named Roscoe Arbuckle. Fatty was his stage name. But he went by Fatty in his film career for obvious reasons. He was a large guy, between 250 and 300 pounds, give or take a couple pounds. He came to prominence during the silent era of film, which was roughly between 1895 and 1936. That's known as the silent film era. Although the first talkie was in 1927, and it was called The Jazz Singer, FYI, for any of you bar trivia buffs. But because there was no synchronized sound in this early period of movie making, slapstick comedy was a big seller. And this is where Fatty excelled in. You see, because of the physical nature of slapstick comedy, it worked well when there was no sound. Now let me go into a little bit of how Fatty began his career. He was a pretty good singer and an agile individual, and while he was working in a hotel one day, a professional singer overheard him singing while he worked, as people do from time to time, and he invited him to perform at an amateur talent show. And this was the kind of talent show where the audience would judge an act's worthiness by cheering and clapping. I'm sure you've all seen your high school talent shows or whatever. Now, if you sucked, you got the hook off the stage. Well, old Fatty, after singing and dancing a bit, began to garner the audience's jeers, and as the stage hook appeared to pull him off, he promptly did a somersault into the orchestra pit, which the audience just loved, because what's funnier than a fat man rolling into the orchestra pit? Not much. Well, this saved him from the hook, and it also won him the talent show. So, you know, this inspired him and motivated him to pursue this kind of career. And soon after winning, he began performing on the regular. He performed in variety act type of shows and in theater troops, and he soon became the main draw of these shows. He traveled around the world, and in 1909, he began his film career. But he really got his big break in Keystone Cops, which were silent film comedies about incompetent policemen. And you might hear people refer to incompetence nowadays with Keystone Cop insults. This is where that's from. By 1918, he was getting so popular with his pie-in-the-face comedy that his movies were making huge money for the studios. So much so that Paramount offered him a three-year, $3 million contract. So that's $1 million a year. Pretty nice. And at this time, $1 million was equivalent to $16 million today. And over three years, that's about $48 million in today's money. So that is very lucrative back then. And even today, I mean, heck, half of that is phenomenal. You go, Fatty! And he did go. In fact, Fatty Arbuckle was the first actor in Hollywood 
to be paid $1 million. And this was in 1918. That's an absurd amount of money. Well, as you can imagine, Fatty was riding high in 1921. And Fatty's friend, Fred Feischbach, decided to plan a little Labor Day bash in the form of a three-day excursion with Fatty to the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco to celebrate. I imagine the planning went something like this. Hello? Hey, Jimmy. What's going on? It's your boy, Fatty. Oh, hey, brah. What's the dilly? The dilly is me, Fred, and all the cool people are getting together this weekend to get crazy stupid with it in San Fran. Are you down? Brah, of course I'm down. What, I'm gonna miss a legendary Fatty Labor Day weekend party? Yo, how's the honey situation? Jimmy, it's the fat man. The honey situation is going to be tis I eat. I got flappers coming in and don't tell the fuzz, but some grade A alcohol is going to be flowing, flowing with my homies. Brah, word, what do I need to bring? Son, you know what you got to bring. Bro, say no more. I'll bring a case of pies. Yeah, boy. So, I guess that's how it went down. Yeah. So, Fatty and his friends uh, rented out some rooms on the 20th floor of the hotel. And as you can imagine, in the roaring 20s, it was pretty well stocked with some bootleg liquor. And everyone was drunk. Now, to be clear, Fatty didn't plan the party. It was all Fred's idea. But with any good A-list party, there's bound to be young starlets and shady people who want to get in on the shindig. And two of the people who wanted to get down in the shindig were the partygoers named Virginia Rapp and Maude Delmont. Now, Rapp was a clothing designer slash model slash small time slash aspiring actress. And Delmont was a woman well known to authorities for extortion, racketeering, being a madam, and other questionable activities. In fact, the police had filed at least 50 counts of said activities against Delmont. Classy lady. So September 5th, uh, Monday, rolls around and it's 3 p.m. Fatty decided to retire from the party and get ready to go sightseeing, because that's what you do in San Fran after getting drunk. But what happens next is the bone of contention, so to speak. And I'll just pass along the two different accounts. First, Fatty's version. Fatty said he went to his room and found Virginia Rapp in the bathroom throwing up. He then said he assisted her in cleaning herself up, then it escorted her to the bed to rest. Of course, he thought she was overly intoxicated, so he left the room but then came back to the room a few minutes later and found Rap on the floor. He then put her back in the bed and left to go get help. Now, here's Ma Delmont's version. She said that Mr. Fatty herded Virginia Rap into his bedroom and said something like, quote, I've waited for you for five years, and now I've got you, unquote. She then says that partygoers heard Rap scream and that she went to Fatty's room to try to open the door. And she couldn't open it. She even tried kicking it in. Still couldn't open it. But then Fatty finally came and opened the door wearing Virginia's hat and smiling foolishly and said also that Rap was naked and moaning in the bed behind Fatty. So those are the two questionable accounts the next part is more verifiable by the other partiers, and it happened this way. When other partygoers entered Fatty's room, they saw Rap was there tearing at her clothes, which apparently she had a habit of doing when she got drunk, which was quite often. You see, Rap was a frequent in this party scene, kind of a socialite, I guess. Now, the partiers tried to make Rap better with various treatments like dousing her in ice, but they were unsuccessful. 
She was eventually moved to another room and a doctor was summoned. Initially, the doctor just said that she was intoxicated and it wasn't until two days later that she was moved to a proper hospital because she wasn't getting better. Now, while at the hospital, Rapp's quote, friend, Maud, told the doctor that Fatty raped Virginia. But when the doctor examined Rapp, he found no signs of rape. And one day after being admitted to the hospital, Virginia Rapp died of peritonitis caused by a ruptured bladder. And peritonitis is an inflammation of the membrane around your abdominal wall and organs causes maybe medical procedures, ruptured appendixes, pancreatitis, or trauma. There's other ones too, but those are kind of the basics. Now, after Virginia died, Ma Delmond went to the police and said Fatty raped her friend. And I guess the death could have been caused by Fatty's mm, fatness and during the act, his large mass ruptured her bladder, which led to her death. That was kind of the going theory on it. Okay, so Fatty turns himself in and is in jail for three weeks. Now, by this time, as you can imagine, the press was having a field day. One of the biggest stars in Hollywood, both figuratively and literally, had just handed the newspaper the hottest selling story in recent times. And they did exploit it. Yellow journalism was running amok and rumors of Fatty's sexual depravities and the events in the hotel were feeding a public hungry for the salacious details. There were graphic accounts of ice and bottles being used on Miss Rat by Fatty, as well as cartoons depicting Fatty as a hard-drinking sex fiend. So Fatty was charged with manslaughter and went to trial in November. And as you can imagine here, with the national interest this garnered, it was hard to find impartial people for the jury. But I suppose what follows is a classic case of trial in the media versus actual evidence. So the first trial ended in a hung jury with 10 in favor for acquittal and 2 in favor of finding Fatty guilty. The next trial happened in January and also ended in a hung jury, this time 10 in favor of guilty and 2 in favor of acquittal. The third and final trial was in March of 1922, and it resulted in an acquittal in less than five minutes of deliberation. Hooray! Hashtag justice for Fatty. Only after the trials, Fatty's career took a hard nosedive. Around the time of the trials, Hollywood decided it needed a rehabilitation of its wild image. And not just because of Fatty's incident, although his was the cherry on top of the string of scandals and deaths that rocked Hollywood. But in order to have a better public image, Hollywood developed the Hayes Code, which was a self-policing organization to help guide the industry's morals. It was started in 1922 by Presbyterian elder Will Hayes, and this organization was kind of the precursor to the movie rating system you know today, PG-13, R, etc. But the code set out some strict guidelines for movie makers to follow, and I'll link these in the show notes as it's too many to go over here. But some of the don'ts include no inference of sex perversions, no depictions of interracial relationships, no ridicule of clergy, and no depicting children's sex organs. Hit and miss on many points. So this Hayes Code, which is sometimes also called the Hayes Office, blacklisted Fatty because of the scandal, even though he was found not guilty. Studios didn't want anything to do with him because of the public perception. Now the Hayes Office did lift the band after about eight months, but it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. You see, the damage was already done to Fatty's career. And for years, Fatty couldn't get work. He spiraled downward into what we might call today depression, finding solace in alcohol. He just had a really rough time with dealing with this. I mean, think about it yourself. You're on top of the mountain and boom, you get knocked down it. Now, during this time, he went through several divorces, but eventually he started getting work again. Mostly bit parts, and he did some directing, but under a pseudonym. Now, in 1932, 10 years after the scandal, 
Warner Brothers signed him to a contract, and it seemed old Fatty A was ready to make a comeback. But in June of 1933, shortly after signing his new contract, he had a massive heart attack, dying in his sleep at the age of 46. And that's the story of Fatty Arbuckle, media hysteria, and blacklisting. And now you know what I know. This has got to be one of the greatest Hollywood scandals ever. You see, Fatty Arbuckle was a huge star, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. And his on-screen charm and physical comedy gifts surely puts him up there on par with other large and hard-partying funny men like Chris Farley, John Candy, and John Belushi. Interestingly, all three of those men were considered to play Fatty Arbuckle in movies at some point, but these movies never quite got off the ground. But what about the death of Virginia Rapp? Well, her death, although tragic, seems like it may have actually stemmed from a recent abortion, and the hard weekend of parting only exasperated the condition. You see, that rupture she had internally was probably from a botched abortion procedure, or at least, you know, the medical standards back then weren't quite what they are today. So you can see where it was easy for her to have something go wrong, not really know it, go out partying, and just it spiraled out of control until she died. I have no doubt Fatty didn't kill Rap. And together with the dubious blackmail tendencies of Delmont, it's easy to see why the third jury got the verdict right, after the media sensation died down, a little anyways. Another odd aspect of the scandal was that a lot of Fatty Arbuckle's films weren't preserved, so he may not be as familiar to audience today as many of his contemporaries. The lack of preservation seems to be from a combination of just poor archiving in early Hollywood, but also a lack of interest because he was blacklisted after all. Who cares about a deviant pervert's films, right? Well, Hollywood didn't, so they didn't really make an effort to save those aspects of his, his work. It's a shame a promising career was derailed so harsh and so quickly, but perhaps this should serve as a cautionary tale, not just to the media, but also as a consumer of news. It's wise not to leap before all evidence is in, but I suppose the thirst of the media and the general public for a scandal in the 1920s isn't so much different than today. But now for something that also hasn't changed much over the years. The haiku? Poor Mr. Fatty. Innocent, but guilty too. His name makes me laugh. And that's all the time this week. Check out our main site for other stories on IncredibleStoriesPodcast.com. Send me an email or haiku through the website. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at IncredPod. Rate us on iTunes and peep us out on YouTube and Stitcher. For Incredible Stories Podcast, I'm Josh, and remember, the journey of a thousand tales begins with the first word.